Welcome back to the Dr. Cliff Show. In this episode, we're answering some of your unanswered questions. Coming up. Welcome back to the Dr. Cliff Show, everyone. I think you'll notice that Dr. Cliff isn't here today, but we'll comment more on that later. My name is Dr. Rachel Cook. I am an audiologist at Applied Hearing Solutions in Phoenix, Arizona, and I am joined by my new co-host today. Hi there, guys. My name is Kelsey Beck. I'm the audiology resident at Applied Hearing Solutions, also in Phoenix, Arizona. And normally during these episodes, I am off to the sidelines and I am monitoring the question section, making sure that uh, we have a good amount of questions for the end of the show when we do our live Q&A. However, we don't always have the opportunity or the time to fully answer some of the questions that are a bit more complex, that need a bit more explanation, and so that's exactly what we are going to do today. We have compiled some of the questions that definitely require longer answers, uh, and we're really going to do a deep dive into those, um, especially because Dr. Olson had a flight to catch, and so as you can see, again, he is not here, uh, but that is okay. We are going to do him justice and we're going to get all of these questions answered. Definitely. So before we start jumping into these questions, we have our first sponsor segment. So we're opening up here with Eosera. So Eosera is an entire comprehensive lineup of ear care products. They have products for ear pain, ear itch, and what I'm most familiar with are their products for ear wax removal. Mm -hmm. And so if you've got stubborn ear wax that just won't quit, um, their ear wax MD product is awesome at really breaking up that wax and dissolving it so that you can then flush it out or have it flushed out by a provider as well. Um, we use this earwax MD in office because sometimes we just end up getting that stubborn wax that just mm -hmm. will not move. And we have used other products in the clinic as well. And there's nothing that removes wax or loosens that wax up like earwax MD does. So they have many, many more products than just earwax MD, um, including recently they added to the lineup a uh, AirPod or, or earbud cleaning mm -hmm. kit as well if you need to do some deep cleaning on your products at home. Um, but overall, great lineup of products. So make sure that if you are interested in any of the products that we've spoken about to visit eosera.com. And if you use the promo code CLIFF20, that will get you 20% off your entire purchase. So thank you to eosera. Yes, thank you, eosera. Um, okay, so let's dive into the very first question. Um, are there medications that can affect your hearing? Most definitely. So I feel like this question um, comes up, I, I want to say frequently, but more often it's that we say something along the lines of, mm -hmm. well, these medications can affect your hearing. And patients go, wait, what? Yeah. I had no idea. And there are quite a few medications that can affect your hearing primarily four classes of medication. So what's the first one there? Uh, so the first one are NSAIDs. So non-steroid, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. So things like mm -hmm. aspirin. Um, and so those things are very common that, you know, especially older people tend to take on a daily regimen. Yeah. Um, but again, something about these two is that while we're listing some of these uh, medications, you know, your doctors have obviously uh, weighed all of the risks and benefits and things like that. And so this is not an advertisement to not be taking your daily regimen of aspirin, um, but it is something to be aware of that if it is something that is pertinent uh, in your medication lineup that you do make sure that you are also paying attention to your hearing uh, when we're talking about these as well. Yeah, for sure. And a lot of people will end up getting potentially a medical procedure done and then they're recommended to take really, really high, high doses of mm -hmm. these NSAIDs. And that's really what we're looking out here for mostly. You know, if you take a, a a small amount of that medication likely not going to have an effect on the ears but if you're taking large large doses over an extended period of time there definitely stands a chance that it can affect your hearing at that point mm -hmm. now generally though any effect on hearing from NSAIDs that fall in this class tends to be temporary so that's the good news um, at higher doses and at more chronic usage uh, potentially not but for the most part effects from that class tend to be temporary. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the second one uh, that I want to talk about is aminoglycoside antibiotics. And now that's a very large word, but it is a class of antibiotics. Um, gentamicin is probably the most common one that I think we talk about as far as being uh, having an effect on your hearing, having an effect on tinnitus as well. Um, these are 
fairly regularly used. Mm -hmm. um, most often they're like an IV antibiotic setup. Yeah. Um, and so uh, again, all of these have been weighed uh, by your doctors. But right. again, after you have these administered, uh, if you are noticing difficulty hearing or a change in your hearing, if you already have a hearing loss, again, definitely go and seek out your audiologist uh, to go and have your hearing tested at that For point. For sure. Now, back in the day, uh, I don't really know exactly when it switched over, but um, it's pretty new that we've started learning these associations between medications and, and hearing loss or tinnitus or uh, any sort of impact on the ears. And so a lot of these antibiotics were actually used at really high doses. And uh, I have quite a few patients actually who underwent significant antibiotic treatments while they were hospitalized. Mm -hmm. And of course, at that point, it's like you got to weigh your options, exactly. right? Exactly. You have a very serious infection that needs to be treated. You don't have any other option at that point. However, they do have this lasting hearing loss from that. And so it's just important to ask the questions when mm -hmm. you are you know, proceeding with, with treatment with any of these medications. Um, but I do believe that medical professionals are also making a much more conscious effort to avoid uh, over prescribing these types of medications that definitely have an impact on your ears and on your hearing. Absolutely. Uh, so what is the other uh, classification of drugs that have an effect on your hearing? Um, well, the next one that we're going to talk about here is loop diuretics. And so these medications generally are to help with um, conditions that result in fluid retention. Mm -hmm. And so these just end up changing kind of some of the chemical balance, if you will, in, internally in your own body. Mm -hmm. And that can actually impact the ability of the cells to to transport the ions that they need right. to allow you to hear appropriately. So again, this is another one that generally results in very temporary changes to hearing. However, extended use, chronic use, and at high dosages, uh, there can be a little bit more of a permanent effect there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the very last one that we are going to talk about is chemotherapy. Um, and so I'm, you know, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, some providers are better about asking this or beginning this, but it's something that's very common with cancer treatment is yeah. that when you do start going through chemotherapy, especially if it is one that is known to cause hearing difficulties, uh, you will most likely be put on some sort of a program either by your uh, oncologist or by your audiologist if you've already seen one where we will monitor your hearing as you complete chemotherapy treatments because it does have an effect, especially on your high frequencies. Um, um, and so all of that would uh, cause some difficulty in hearing, can again uh, have an impact on tinnitus as well. Um, and so again, chemotherapy, when that is begun, most oncologists are referring for um, hearing monitoring throughout that treatment time. Yeah, and that's pretty serious too because what they generally tend to do is seriously do a baseline test before you start any sort of treatment. Mm -hmm. And then after the baseline has been obtained, and they administer that first round of treatment. I mean, when we're talking hearing monitoring, this is very different than your annual hearing test that you might get with your audiologist. This is pre-treatment, post-treatment, again, after your next round, again, after your next round. I'm talking extremely close monitoring of your hearing here. Mm -hmm. Now, this is for very specific chemotherapy drugs. So not every single person who has undergone chemo is going to have taken this specific drug, um, but it's just another one of those important questions to ask because unfortunately, a lot of individuals have to go through chemotherapy treatments. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and and you know, again, kind of like we do with all of the other videos and content that we create, is that the better informed you are when starting things like this, or just better informed that you are in order to ask these yeah. types of questions, the better off you're going to be in the long run. And so absolutely wanna make sure that you're having these discussions with your physicians for sure. Okay, I got another question for you. All right, let's do it. All right, so next question is, I was recently diagnosed with diabetes and one of my doctors recommended I get my hearing tested mm -hmm. but didn't really give me a reason why. Is there a connection there and is it the medications? That is an excellent question. So there is a high correlation between hearing loss and diabetes. We are still investigating the complete interaction between the two, um, but what we do know is that the imbalance of glucose levels, whether they are too low or too high, can cause damage inside the cochlea, which is your hearing organ, um, and it can also cause damage to the blood vessels and to the nerves as well that feed the cochlea. And so anytime that you're going to go uh, and look at damage that can be caused by a specific condition, you know, 
the cochlea is a very teeny tiny organ mm -hmm. uh, and it lives within your uh, your temporal bone inside your skull and so when we're looking at how small these blood vessels really are the slightest bit of damage because again they are microscopic uh, can really have a large effect on them and so you really want to make sure that you know if you are being newly diagnosed or even if you're pre-diabetic because people with uh, that are pre-diabetic still have a 30 percent uh, risk increase of developing a hearing loss versus somebody who is not pre-diabetic and so it's something definitely that you want to make sure that you are having evaluated and having evaluated regularly. Definitely. Diabetes overall is a, a very uh, sensory related disorder, mm -hmm. right? So diabetes when it's well monitored and when it's well managed, generally you can still lead a very healthy, happy life. However, if it is unmonitored or unmanaged or not managed well, we see this result in issues with all of our senses really um, feeling, mm -hmm. right? So diabetic neuropathy mm -hmm. in, in the extremities, um, uh, perhaps diabetic retinopathy mm -hmm. in the eyes. And we do see this impact on hearing as well. And like you said, there's a 30% increased risk in developing hearing loss, even for patients who are pre-diabetic. So at this point, you don't even have a diagnosis mm -hmm. of being diabetic, and there's still this increased risk. And it's difficult to say if it's going to be a, a sudden shift in hearing mm -hmm. or a more gradual shift in hearing, but what we do know and what I have seen in the clinic anecdotally is that uh, yes, my patients that have diabetes, particularly diabetes that is not well managed, their hearing uh, thresholds do tend to shift pretty quickly. Yeah, and they do shift from year to year as well. The other piece to acknowledge about diabetes as well is that it does come again with all of those, you know, it can come with a lot of comorbidities as well. So high blood pressure, hypertension, uh, heart disease, all of those are also known to have an effect yeah. on your hearing loss. And so really making sure that not only are you managing your diabetes, but any other comorbidities that have come with your diabetes um, is also very important to maintain. Or if you know that you have another one of these comorbidities, maybe you're not even talking about you know diabetes at this point but you do have hypertension or you do have heart disease things like that can have an impact on your hearing yeah that you bring up a great point because uh, another you know huge risk factor for developing hearing loss is going to be any sort of cardiovascular issues and so again mm -hmm. if you're not being monitored regularly by a primary care physician or you're not uh, going in for you know these annual hearing tests it's very important to be aware of the fact that your ears really depend on you having a very healthy body and a healthy system overall. Mm -hmm. um, there's not necessarily things that you can do besides attempting to protect your hearing that um, is going to have a huge impact on keeping your hearing where it is other than keeping your body really, really healthy. Mm -hmm. And so I think cardiovascular health is huge. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of these medications as well, you know, can have side effects like tinnitus for them too and so a lot of times patients will come in and they will be taking you know several different medications at the same time and they're trying to figure out why they have such bad tinnitus mm -hmm. and it's like well we've got you know five or six different just heart medications on on your medication list mm -hmm. that is affecting the blood flow very very significantly and if that blood flow to the cochlea as you said earlier is being impeded or if it's not getting there as effectively mm -hmm. as it should be that results in a hearing loss or, or tinnitus or both mm -hmm. to what degree we don't know exactly how fast or how quickly it just mm -hmm. depends you know case by case basis but it definitely has a huge, huge impact. Absolutely, and just like you said, every every person is different because every person is going to have different puzzle pieces that we're putting together. And so your audiologist, when you do go in for your communication needs assessment for a hearing test, uh, they're going to ask you questions that may not seem pertinent or relevant to you, uh, but it is very important that these things are addressed. And if your uh, provider is not addressing these questions, um, something to bring up with them on your own. Yeah. Definitely. A lot of a lot of the times the, you know, patient intake paperwork says, you know, are you taking any medications? Mm -hmm. And I have had patients say to me, um, well, that has nothing to do with my ears. Uh, uh, it actually has so everything to do, to with, do your with your ears, ears. <laughs> um, because we've just got to be aware of any sort of medical condition. If you've had a stroke, that needs to be brought up at your appointment. Mm -hmm. If you've had a heart attack, that needs to be brought up. If you've had a significant head injury of mm -hmm. any type or at any time, that needs to be brought up. It's not just diabetes that can have an impact on your hearing. There are so many conditions, so an many entire things. laundry list of conditions 
that should be brought up, um, but these these ones that overall really affect every system in your body. You know, if you have a stroke, chances are that at least temporarily, every system in your body was impacted by that in mm-hmm. some way. Diabetes is the same way, exactly. and for that reason, we have we've got to keep an eye on other systems that could be impacted by that. Absolutely, couldn't have said it better myself. Um, okay, so let's jump into the next sponsor segment. Yeah, so our it. next sponsor is from Esco. So uh, I'm going to start off with a very quick story. So uh, there was a patient who went on an airplane with his new hearing aids, had them month, two months, not very long, both mm-hmm. of them on the, aer- on the airplane. So he was sitting in an airplane that had a windowsill uh, where he set his hearing aids because he was going to take, uh, take a nap on this flight, red-eye flight going across the country. And uh, uh, unfortunately, he was on an airplane that had a gap between the windowsill and the paneling on the inside of the plane. Well, unfortunately, while napping, his hearing aids fell between the paneling and the uh, uh, aircraft. And so he tried to get them out. The flight attendant tried to get them out. Once the plane landed, several other people tried to get them out of that paneling in between the aircraft and the internal cabin. Uh, And obviously couldn't get it out and so uh what he had to do is he had to use his loss and damage claim for both of his brand new hearing aids which Mm. you know is supposed to be able to replace those hearing aids you know for a deductible rather than buying a whole new set of hearing aids uh for you know and it's good for you know the first three years or so depending on your warranty well he had to use it within the first couple months and so what we recommended to him at that point was actually to go with esco Mm -hmm. and to actually have an extended uh warranty and an extended loss and damage claim that he could use again uh, if he were to run into a very similar situation, not necessarily on an airplane, but if he lost them or damaged them beyond repair following that day. Uh, and so if you wanted to go over to esco.com forward slash Dr. Cliff, viewers get a $10 gift card just for registering your hearing aids, but they also have a laundry list of other programs that they have uh, for insuring your hearing aids, you know, reinstating that loss and damage deductible. Uh, and so ESCO is great, highly recommend and again that ten dollar gift card just for registering your hearing aids with them uh so great yeah. company to have great. Uh, in your back pocket for sure <laughs> definitely i had a patient today who was telling me that he was driving down the road and he had his window down and and um you know had kind of like turned his head to look around and uh the wind caught his hearing aid off of his ear he had felt like it was scooting out the wind caught it boom, straight out of the window oh, and it was a goner so yeah definitely if you do not currently have a loss and damage uh warranty on your hearing aids because maybe uh they are out of their initial warranty period mm-hmm. or if you've already lost your devices and have had to have them replaced once then you need to re-up that coverage for sure because crazy things happen yeah and that plain one when you were telling me that earlier i was like wait what i would never (laughs) think about that little tiny it's so small and yet so are your hearing aids so guys lesson for you guys do not put your hearing aids on the windowsill of an airplane just don't do it. <laughs> Let's keep them in your ears. Let's keep them Absolutely. in your ears if we can. For sure. Okay, you got another question for me, I huh? do have another question for you. So, do individuals with a noise-induced hearing loss that have tinnitus, when treated, will the tinnitus go away, or do you mask it with a program? Mm, so, this is a fully loaded question, <laughs> and right? they all are. <laughs> they all are. So, we've got to start with the fact that we're talking about a noise-induced hearing loss. Okay, so this person... Uh, who asked this question initially, they must know that they have hearing loss and they also must know that they have a noise-induced pattern or that they had just had such significant repeated loud noise exposure that they know that their hearing loss was caused by noise damage. Mm -hmm. And now they've got this associated tinnitus from it as well. And they asked a, a really interesting question too of, if I treat the hearing loss, do we need to add even additional things on top of that or not? Mm-hmm. So I think that we should start by unpacking what is tinnitus, right? Because uh. we haven't done very many episodes mm-hmm. on this yet. I'm chomping at the bit to get into this topic <laughs> because it's really something that I'm so, so, so interested in. Um, but I think it's important to make the uh, first initial kind of disclaimer that tinnitus itself is not actually a condition and I feel like very often I have patients that come into the office saying what can I do to make tinnitus go away what can I do to make tinnitus go away tinnitus is not actually a condition it is a symptom Mm -hmm. it is a symptom from 
a different condition, right. something that's going on, right? And so we that's what actually why it's ultimately so difficult to treat or to eliminate or mm -hmm. to cure um, because there are so many reasons why tinnitus may be occurring in the first place. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and so, again, could be hearing loss related. Mm -hmm. uh, a traumatic brain injury, so a head injury, can also have an impact on tinnitus. Um, oh, man. I mean, there, again, even diet, uh, I have tinnitus just in my left ear, and it's only when it starts to rain because of the barometric pressure changes in the atmosphere. Uh, and it go and it comes and goes. Like I, like, I can always tell when it's going to rain because my tinnitus acts up. It's And so there are so many things that can be caused by it. But so, for example, treating my tinnitus that happens when it rains with hearing aids or with a masking program is not going to be effective. No, right? definitely and, not. And so you really have to know and really dig deep into what can cause tinnitus. Now, again, with this individual, uh, you know, noise-induced hearing loss, uh, definitely plays a role in where the creation of this tinnitus for this particular individual is. However, again, for the rest of our viewers, who maybe you don't have a noise-induced hearing loss. Uh, absolutely, there's so many things that can be causing it, and you know your uh, audiologist will ask a lot of questions, even if they seem again unrelated, to really get at yeah. the root of what the tinnitus is caused by. Because again, it is a symptom of another condition that is going on. Right, and I, I make this comparison in office sometimes too because I feel like there's relatively few other symptoms that you can make the comparison with that that make a whole lot of sense but um, sometimes I will compare tinnitus to nausea okay right because nausea is something that comes and goes generally for most people mm -hmm. some people do have more chronic nausea other people it comes and it goes there's nothing that I can give you and there's nothing that I can do for you that will result in the permanent elimination of nausea ever being a factor in your life again yeah right I can't make that every once in a while icky stomach feeling mm -hmm. go away or uh, you know if you get the stomach flu I, I there's nothing yeah. I can do to guarantee that this is not going to present itself in your life again however in that same respect as with nausea there's a lot of reasons why nausea might be occurring we get nausea from motion sickness we get nausea uh, if you become pregnant there's so many reasons why you may be nauseous and for that reason there's not ever going to be this one-size-fits-all kind of mm -hmm. cure or fix for it what we need to do is find out are there, is there, you know, a reason, right? And so hearing loss mm -hmm. is a, is highly, highly associated with tinnitus. And so if we can effectively treat the hearing loss itself, actually six out of 10 patients who have hearing loss and tinnitus together actually see nearly immediate relief just from the use of well-fit hearing aids alone. Mm -hmm. And so they asked the question, um, do I need to have a program in there to, to mask it? Well, 60% of patients actually don't need any additional factors mm -hmm. at that point we can just fit them with well-fit hearing aids and the amplification of the ambient sound alone is enough to help decrease the perception of that yeah absolutely and and again there are going to be that you know four out of ten who do not see that immediate benefit and so then that's when we would start to implement things like a masking program um, but there are also a lot of things too that you can do stress is highly correlated with increased perception of tinnitus uh, diet lifestyle is also also highly associated with tinnitus as well. So uh, I think very frequently a lot of people will say, you know, low sodium diet or no alcohol. But again, each person is going to react to each different uh, strategy differently. So yep. for some people, you know, low sodium might be the trick. For other people, that is not going to work at all. And so it is a lot of trial and error sometimes. Uh, and it's not that, you know, your audiologist or, you know, your dietitian or what have you uh, doesn't know what they're doing. It's that this is such a broad spectrum of how you may react to each individual strategy uh, that, you know, we do have to try a lot of things. Better sleep, highly correlated with a uh, reduction in tinnitus uh, exercise. Again, there are medications as well that have a side effect of tinnitus. Mm -hmm. And so that's also really important to pay attention to as well. Like you were saying earlier, someone was coming to you who had a whole host of medications trying to figure out why their tinnitus wasn't going away. And well, again, we're not going to tell you not to take your medications that have been, you know, pros and cons have been weighed by your medical provider, but it is something to be taken into account when we are trying to mitigate the perception of tinnitus. Definitely something to be aware of. Um, I, 
I just recently put a video out about this idea of sound therapy mm-hmm. for the treatment or management right. uh, of tinnitus. And really, when the question initially was asked of, you know, is there a need to have a program in the hearing aids to help mask the tinnitus? Uh, if you haven't seen that video already, definitely go back and give that a watch, especially if you have tinnitus, because I think it lays down some of the framework of why, if you have an internal sound that's bothersome, why would my audiologist recommend adding more sound? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's like I'm trying to get the inside sound to go down. Why would I just start playing more sounds around me yeah but sound therapy is so so highly effective um, because what we really do see is that these structures that are damaged in the cochlea for one reason or another um, end up kind of either sending signals up to the brain that there's stimulation there when there's not stimulation Mm -hmm. there or it's the reverse where the brain is not receiving an appropriate amount of stimulation and it kind of as a as a coping mechanism it kind of makes up the difference in yeah, a way it generates its own sound because it's not getting the sound that it needed it does exactly and so we can kind of mitigate some of that response by actually adding a little bit more external mm-hmm. stimulation into the ears and so that's what that that person is asking in that question do i need a program something that's been actually put into my hearing aids to deliver a little bit of background low level sound Mm -hmm. to keep my ears busy during the day and the answer is maybe definitely now i start all of my tinnitus patients just uh, if they have a hearing loss Mm -hmm. i start them just with the hearing aids alone because most of the time that's really enough to do it Mm -hmm. and if you have hearing aids already and you're not seeing the relief from the tinnitus that you were expecting I would also question how the hearing aids are programmed because Mm -hmm. far too often in the office, we see patients who are wildly under amplified and well below their prescriptive targets. And if the hearing aids are not creating that auditory stimulation that Mm -hmm. you need to decrease the perception of tinnitus, then yeah, you are going to continue to have that tinnitus perception loud and clear, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. And even those who are come in overfit in specific areas, yeah. so the sound is even too loud in specific areas, or, you know, you just keep turning up the volume because you've watched some of our videos and you're saying, oh, sometimes more sound can be uh, beneficial. If you're not getting the sound in the correct yeah. place, in the appropriate quantity, it doesn't matter how much sometimes that you give it, you could even potentially make the perception worse because everything is getting louder except the sound you're missing. Exactly. Right? Exactly. And, and so it's all very important to make sure that your hearing aids, whether it's for tinnitus or hearing loss, they're fit appropriately, following best practices, using real ear verification. All of those factors are so important for you to get the best possible outcome, whether you're treating just the noise-induced hearing loss or attempting to treat tinnitus, whether from noise-induced hearing loss or otherwise. Yeah. Yeah, it's really important if you have if you have extremely bothersome tinnitus that you see a professional or provider that really knows what they're doing because mm-hmm. there are so many factors that go into this. They got to have a good understanding of what they're doing. Otherwise, you may still find that the tinner, that the tinnitus is still bothersome in that way. So, mm-hmm. just make sure you do your do- due diligence, do your research, and, and find a provider that you really trust, because if you trust them, that's just going to make the the process so much easier on Absolutely. you. Absolutely. All right. Okay. Should we jump into that next sponsor segment? We do. We All have right. another sponsor segment here. So as most people are well aware now, especially if you watch any of our content or mm-hmm. have in the past, OTC over-the-counter hearing aids are here. And if you have a mild to moderate hearing loss, you may be looking for what your best option is or all of the options out there as well. And that's why today we are gonna talk about the Santro over-the-counter hearing aids by Soundwave. Now, Santros are really, really interesting because they actually use an app, a dual purpose app here. Mm -hmm. So we've got the Autotune app. And with the app, you start by taking a quick three minute hearing test to really personalize your hearing aids. And then after that test is done, you can also make adjustments to the settings of your devices from that Autotune app as well. And you can see a picture of it up on the screen there. It's basically giving you a, a little report card of your hearing in the low, the mid, and the high frequencies. And then it 
kind of offers up these programming changes and options to try to optimize the devices for you. So if you're looking for something that's a little personalized, but also you play a role in how things are being programmed, mm -hmm. then Santro might be a great option for you. So if you want more information on these devices, Dr. Cliff also did an entire review video of these um, on our YouTube channel as well. So make sure you check that one out on YouTube. And, um, and to look into these devices yourself, you can visit www hearsoundwave.com and look into their product lineup and what all they offer. So thank you, Santro. Thank you, Santro. Okay, let's hop into this next question here. All right, I think I'm asking it to you. I think so. so. Um, this question that we got, oh, I love this one so much. If I only wear my hearing aids situationally, will I ever get used to this sound or will it always sound robotic? What a great Question. A great question, and and sometimes we I hear this question all of the time uh, from so many people. I mean, even this week, I think I've heard it from four different people. Um, the short answer is no. You have to wear your hearing aids uh, the majority of your waking hours for optimal benefit. Mm -hmm. So essentially, what you're doing when we're fitting hearing aids is we're changing how your brain hears and understands sound. Right? You. For the most part, people go, you know, a long time unnecessarily not treating their hearing loss. And so this has gotten to the point where it has gradually gotten worse over time. And, you know, your brain has been making its compensations as best as it can. You know, we often uh, equate it to a Wheel of Fortune game. And so, you know, you're playing Wheel of Fortune, you've got a few letters here and there, and then your brain is working really hard to fill in all of those gaps, right? And so your brain gets good at this and it, and it becomes the way that it's used to. So what we're doing when we're now giving it back some of the sound that it's been missing, and ideally we're doing it, again, very precisely uh, to make sure that you have access to all the speech components, again, because the main goal is that you're going to be able to hear speech, uh, is that you need to change your brain and how your brain is understanding sound because it no longer has to recruit so much uh, time and effort from other parts of the brain to fill in this gap, but you're also making sure that you know you can take the sound and make use of it and make sense of it in the way that your auditory system was designed to do it, right? And so if you're just going to wear your hearing aids, when you go out in background noise, well, what if I were to tell you that when you go out in background noise, your success in that arena is going to be much better if you're also wearing them when you're at home alone because guess what? Sounds like your footsteps on the ground, the air conditioning, cars driving by your house, all of those things make sounds that you're supposed to be able to hear. Mm -hmm. And I think that because you've maybe forgotten or have not had access to these sounds in so long, your brain is registering these as all new information, right? Yeah. And new information is important to your brain because your brain is always looking to learn. And so your brain is relearning that your footsteps on the ground are not supposed to draw your attention, but you have to give it the time, you have to give it the space to adapt, to ignore that sound once again, because your brain used to do that, and now you just have to give it the opportunity to do that again. Oh, most definitely. This idea of contrast, I think, is really significant. Mm -hmm. So depending on the amount of hearing loss that you have and the severity, um, Really, if, if you're unaided or if you have not proceeded yet with hearing treatment, your world is going to be much softer or much quieter, much mm -hmm. more rounded, right? And then it, let's say that that issue right there of a softer, quieter world has led you into an audiologist's office to proceed with hearing treatment. Mm -hmm. When you do proceed with hearing treatment and we reinstate all of those sounds again, it can be a lot, like you said. Quite and jarring. To yeah, exactly. And so this idea of, okay, when I keep my hearing aids out, everything is much softer, much quieter, much more dull. When I put my hearing aids in, it's so much sound, I can't handle it, mm -hmm. right? It's this contrast, this back and forth between so much sound and not enough sound. And so the best place that you can be wearing your hearing aids is at home because if you can start to get acclimated to the sounds that you can control mm -hmm. like the things in your home environment you can't control when you go into a noisy restaurant you are at the mercy of that noisy restaurant mm -hmm. whatever happens in there happens you got the noisy kitchen you got the reflective surfaces you got a bunch of people having conversations in there everything in that situation is outside of your control what is inside of your control is your home environment for the most part and uh, your work environment so 
so often I have patients in the clinic that just say, um, yeah, I, when I'm at home, I'm alone, you know, I'm not doing a lot, and so I don't wear them, but then I wear them when I go out. Your brain needs this time to be adapting mm -hmm. to sound, and every time that you go to finally wear those hearing aids that you really want to give a shot, you're wearing them in the noisiest, loudest, most difficult listening environment possible. <laughs> so you've got to give yourself a shot at hearing better in these situations that you probably went to the audiologist in the first place saying, I'd like to hear better in these situations. Mm -hmm. You've got to walk before you run. You know, if you get a brand new mountain bike and you've never mountain biked before, and you have two options of trying to take your mountain bike down Mount Everest mm -hmm. <laughs> or take your mountain bike on a quick little stroll down the street, you're probably gonna do a little bit better if you start off with that easier, calmer experience before just trying to, to take it from you know zero to 100 overnight, right? Yeah. So same thing with hearing aids. Give yourself some time to get acclimated to them and continue to wear them in environments where you do have control over the sounds and over the environment because that will only lead to a higher amount of success mm -hmm. in those environments that you don't have as much control. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And the other piece of this too is that, you know, your audiologist should be working with you very, very closely to work on this adaptation, this acclimation period with you. And so, mm -hmm. you know, we in our clinic, we don't just send everybody out full blast at your full prescription uh, day one. Because very rare. It's very rare. Yeah. You know, sometimes if you've been a hearing aid user for a very long time, it's a much different conversation. But especially for that first time user, right, we're not going to just send you out into the world with, at full blast, right? Because you would come back and you would say, I'm not wearing these, here you go, goodbye, mm -hmm. right? That's not, that's not it. That's not gonna solve the problems that brought you into our office to begin with. And so what we'll normally do is we'll go ahead and we'll match you to your prescriptive targets using real ear verification. And mm -hmm. again, if you've not seen our other content about real ear verification and why it's so important, I highly recommend that you do check out that video um, or even our other podcasts about uh, best practices. I think it's a three-parter there and there's a lot of good information there too um, but we'll match you to the, that prescriptive target then we'll start to bring you down to a loud but tolerable level and then over several other very structured appointments we're going to work to increase you towards that prescriptive match and that way we know at the end we've measured we've verified and that's the best you can possibly be hearing because we've been working with you to adapt and acclimatize to reorganize your brain essentially and how you're processing the world oh absolutely i i mean you said it great it's it's really really important that um you know there's not always the time to to, to dive this deep mm -hmm. into these topics at audiology appointments uh particularly if you're going to an ent office if you're going to the va i mean these places are pressed for time, we can sit here for hours mm -hmm. and hours and create so much video content and, and podcasts and talk about this over and over. And each time I still feel like we end up talking about things that we've never talked about before. Mm -hmm. And so to fit all of this information into these shorter appointments isn't necessarily always possible. But it's so important as the end user to know what to expect out of those first few weeks of wearing hearing aids or of wearing hearing aids that have been reprogrammed to actually meet your prescriptive targets mm -hmm. because it is going to be an adaptation process. There, it is going to be different. And you know what? That's why you came into the audiology office in the first place. You wanted things to be different. And so if we can really push through that initial adaptation period, the quickest and the fastest way to do that is to wear your hearing aids for all waking hours from when you wake up to when you go to sleep. We actually have looked at research studies on this. We actually did an episode about cognition and dementia and cognitive decline and, and hearing loss. And we saw with research that the individuals that wore their hearing aids for 90% of their waking hours did much better on this cognition testing mm -hmm. um, when they were actually wearing their devices as much as they were supposed to be. And we used to tell individuals, uh, you know, eight hours, right? Aim for eight hours of aware time because 
we it's like 75 percent of your your waking hours we're finding now with the research that that is much much closer to 90 percent of your waking hours. yeah and, so. and that puts people more at you know the 12 to 14 hours mm-hmm. a day range uh and again that's you know you came to your audiologist to solve uh, specific challenges, the best way to solve them is by wearing your hearing aids as much as humanly possible and having really good communication with your audiologist about things that are going on during this adaptation time. Because there are things that you may not get used to, uh, but if your audiologist doesn't know that these particular sounds or things that in your environment are grating or bothersome, Mm -hmm. there's no way for us to fix it. We say this all the time, take really good notes Bring all of your notes back to us and the things that we can do to keep all of the good things that you like, we're going to do to keep them. Yeah. If there are things that, you know, mm, we can't really be doing those particular things, super last ones, we have a lot of adjustments that we can make, but we don't know to make them unless you tell us. Right. Definitely. So be in good contact with your provider for sure. All right. Uh, so let's hop into this next question. Uh, And it really just flows really nicely into this next question. So what are reasonable expectations for hearing aids? I have hearing loss from aging that my doctor said is moderate and my hearing aids don't give me a lot of benefit. Oh, definitely fully loaded question. Another one. (laughs) I think we can, I think we can get into it for sure. A lot of the things that we just said are going to apply very, very much to this. So I do believe that anytime that we're talking about expectations for hearing aids, we've got to take a few things into account here. And A couple of those things are going to be, what is the level of hearing loss that you have? Mm -hmm. How long have you had this hearing loss? And what impact has that hearing loss had on your auditory processing abilities? Um, Because all of those things play a really, really huge role into how much of a initial, you know, shock you may feel by being treated with hearing Mm -hmm. aids. And the longer the longer anyone goes without having their hearing loss treated the more i don't want to call it shocking but it's definitely um a a bigger appointment i guess for for someone who has never worn Mm -hmm. hearing aids but has noticed their hearing loss for one two or three decades at this point right you've been living in a much quieter world and so to think that the hearing aids are going to be able to eliminate every single environmental sound that your ears have been doing for you naturally over the last few decades and now you you're looking for better you know speech focus and you don't want to hear any sound from your clothes you don't want to hear any footsteps people with normal hearing actually hear those sounds too but their brain has been able to separate out sounds that are classified as important and sounds that are classified as unimportant when all of those sounds have naturally been filtered out by your hearing loss over the years your brain does not do a great job at separating out what sound is important and what sound is not that is why the consistent use of said hearing aids is so important because this idea of contrast again not wearing to wearing, not wearing to wearing. It's very jarring for Mm -hmm. your brain. Your brain needs, needs with hearing aids, needs the time to get acclimated and to get adjusted to these sounds. And without it, Mm -hmm. your expectations may not be met with the devices because they may have not have had a fair Mm -hmm. shot yet. Yeah, absolutely. And then there are so many other factors that will influence this as well, right? And so we do a lot of testing Mm -hmm. uh, when you come in, at least into our office. It's a comprehensive evaluation. Not only are we asking you, you know, press the press the button when you hear the beeps, right? That's a very standard one across the board. We're also doing a lot of speech testing, both in quiet and in background noise. The number one complaint we get as audiologists is, man, I just can't hear anybody when I get into a background noise situation. Well, the the there's a way to test that. Mm-hmm. And so we test that in the office. But if there is a thing that, uh, you know, let's say, for example, that you do have a really difficult time, you know, with severe difficulty in background noise, even in the best case scenario, well, there's no hearing, lo- hearing aid on the planet that alone could make you hear perfectly in a background noise situation. It's just not a reasonable expectation. Now, to give you a little bit of hope, there is absolutely other devices that actually pair with your hearing aid to deliver other people's voices. So, you know, we had an entire episode about assistive listening devices. Mm -hmm. You know, there are remote microphones that you can clip on someone that you're having dinner with in a noisy restaurant or hand to the waiter or waitress so that you can actually hear and understand what they're saying uh, because it's going to be delivered straight to your hearing aids 
at your prescriptive levels. Right. And so there are other things that you can do aside from just wearing your hearing aids. But again, you have to do the testing. You have to know what you're working with. The other piece of that is that even in quiet, not everybody still has the ability to understand speech at 100%. Uh, and, you know, there are, again, a lot of factors that go into that. How much, you know, noise exposure, family history of hearing loss, how long have you gone with an, an untreated hearing loss that can absolutely create create a situation where there's those scores drop from 100 percent to 70 percent mm -hmm. and so no matter how well or how perfectly those hearing aids are programmed for you verified with real ear measurement you know we're taking all of these personalizations into account you're still maximally going to uh you know perform at you know 72 percent if mm -hmm. that is the most you can possibly uh, understand in a quiet situation and so uh, there are a lot of factors that go into reasonable expectations for your hearing aids and for your hearing loss in general and your you know good audiologist will have these conversations with you and say you know what i can do this 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 and this these are the things that cannot be accomplished in just this way we have to do x y and z in order to solve this particular problem problem and again each individual is going to want to solve a different problem yep. uh, and it's our job to discern what is going to be the best for you the best case scenario yep exactly I think it's uh, extremely important that you are very very um, honest and and um, make your expectations known mm -hmm. initially what are you expecting from these devices so that the provider has the chance or the opportunity to let you know if that's a possibility or not a possibility given the hearing devices and giving the hearing loss and the you know word understanding abilities as well and so it's it, this is just one of uh, a million reasons why it is so important to see a provider that does follow best practices as well mm -hmm. and if you're not familiar with the hearing up network um, this is the the best practice provider network that's been established by dr cliff olson because um, individuals were having such a hard time finding providers that would actually follow these steps to help them determine if their expectations were being realistic mm -hmm. and to help them determine um, you know if someone's got a moderate level of hearing loss like the question said initially and they said I'm receiving no benefit or little benefit uh, you should be receiving a ton of benefit with a moderate hearing loss and well fit hearing aids and that's the kicker there well fit being mm -hmm. being that key word so that being said if you do not feel like you're getting the benefit out of your devices that you are looking for, number one, I'd be asking these questions of our best practices being followed. And we have got checklists that are also available on the Hearing Up website that you can um, reference as well or potentially even bring to your provider to see, you know, are you following these steps? Um, it's just so, so important that we are following all of the mm -hmm. steps needed to, to really ensure that your our, our patients are on the same page as us we mm -hmm. both want the same thing we both want you to hear better exactly so you've got to find a provider that you mm -hmm. trust and you've got to have a good relationship with them absolutely and then if you are looking for a best practices provider in your area go ahead and visit hearingup.com there is a find a provider tool that will allow you to search by zip code by city uh, and get you in contact with a provider that does follow best practices uh, and will do the best possible job for you and will really work with you to treat your hearing loss talk about expectations and talk about exactly what's going to be right for you in your particular situation because no two people even with identical hearing losses are going to have the same goals right well i think that we got through a lot there those were some pretty loaded up questions mm -hmm. but uh we wanted to start with ones that had a lot to them because we figured it'd be well worth it to dive in we don't always have the time to dive in at the end of each episode so with that being said we will be doing many many more of these episodes coming up Absolutely. Um, there's just too many good questions that we get that we can't answer so make sure that you continue to ask questions we're going to go through week by week and and pull some out for these episodes like and subscribe for sure so mm -hmm. that you never miss any of our new content speaking of that though we will be taking a three week break here and so a podcast will be on hold for the next three weeks and we will be back with our next podcast episode on january 11th and we will see you then